Hi, welcome to episode 15 of the American Tributaries podcast, where to break out of the bubbles we've been living in these last few years. We are using modern technology to explore the various currents of people in our great country, kind of like a 21st century Lewis and Clark journey. I'm your host, Michael Whitten, and thank you for joining me in this exploration of America. If you enjoy listening, please be sure to subscribe on whatever platform you're using. Give us a heart, a like, thumbs up on this particular episode, and check us out on Instagram at American Tributaries. Um, today, I am so feel so very fortunate to be joined by Taryn Williams. Um, Taryn, I've been interested in speaking with for, I think, since before I actually started this podcast. I had read an article um, that she had written on Medium about her life as a teacher in Alaska and was just so interested in hearing more about what that life is like, especially given how different I'm sure it must be compared to living in like, you know, New York City population density, 27,000 people per square mile, and, you know, a whole bunch of different other reasons why. Um, But with that, Taryn, thanks so much for joining me today. How are you doing? I'm great. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. Oh. Oh, thank you so much. So where, so where are you in Alaska? So I, if Alaska looks like this, I'm on mm-hmm. um, towards the Aleutian Islands. So almost uh-huh. right before the Aleutians start, but at the very last village before. So it's called the Alaska Peninsula. And it's just that part that juts out right before the islands begin. So like that's I mean like I I took a cruise up to Alaska once and we went to like Juneau and Anchorage that's nowhere near you're in a different part of Alaska probably about two it's about two hours south of Anchorage by bush plane but bush planes okay. travel a lot slower than commercial airlines so it'd probably be if it were an Alaska jet it would probably be maybe forty five minutes from Anchorage okay well wow. and like what's the what's the town village like what is, where what's the setting what it where you where what exactly is um, is it perryville did i see correctly yeah um okay. it's, a, it's a tundra it's tundra so we mm. are flat across the village with a lot of grass and uh there aren't officially technically trees that grow here but we do have a few coniferous trees that seem to have been planted within the last 80 to 120 years and then there are alder trees, which are an invasive species here and have only been here for for about 20 years, but they're everywhere now. And other than that, it's, it's tundra. We're surrounded by the mountains and we're also coastal. So it's a little bit of everything because a lot of tundra villages are away from the coast and a lot of them are in, totally flat and not near mount, uh, the mountainous region. So we kind of get a little bit of everything and it's part of why I chose this village out of all the ones in the area. Mm-hmm. And how many people live in the village? 89. I was waiting for 100 or 1,000. 89 people. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> there's, there's more people living in my apartment building. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, there were more um, people living in the apartment building I lived in before I moved here, but uh, it was certainly a change at first. Yeah. Wow. So, um, so like where, I guess to go back a little bit, like where, where were you living before you came there? It's kind of a long story because due to COVID I moved a lot of places, but I lived in most recently longer term. I was living in Germany. I was living in a village in Germany for about three years. And then I came back to the U S with the intention of staying here for six months before I was going to going to go abroad again and live in the Dominican Republic. And because I was only going to be here for six months, I planned two short contractual stints. So I did it three months in New Hampshire uh, at an outdoor education organization. And then I did three months in Atlanta. And I was two days into my stint in the Dominican Republic when that was canceled due to COVID. Or I I wasn't there yet. I was in my training, but we were two days into the into the position and that was canceled. So I looked for another position and I found one in Alaska and I ended up coming to Alaska right away, but I lived in two other places before settling here. So, um, and you were, you mentioned before we, we started recording that you had gotten your master's, obviously I guess in, in education. Yes. Yeah. I have a master's okay. of science in education. Okay. And, um, what led you to decide on going, on going to Alaska? I was quite disappointed when my plans in the Dominican Republic were canceled. It was, I was supposed to be there for three years and at least uh, maybe longer. 
And I didn't feel quite ready to return to quote unquote traditional American settings. I, I felt like when I taught in Philly, I, I loved the students when I taught in Philly and I loved working in the school there, but there were so many things about that that I was ready to, about the system that I was ready to get away from for a while. And so once I found out I wasn't going to Dominican, it was March 2020, so it was the height of COVID. So I wasn't going to be able to go abroad anywhere else. And I thought, where could I go that would still be a cultural experience and still be different, but that I can get to at this point in time? And a position in the Alaskan bush popped up on Indeed maybe a day or two after I started looking. So it worked out really quickly and really perfectly. Wow. And like, so, and what is your, like when you signed up to go there, like how much did you know about like, have you been to Alaska before? Like, what did you know? And like, what was it like once you got there? I had never been to Alaska and I had, didn't know anybody who had done anything like this, but it's something I'd actually started thinking about shortly before that, because right before I was supposed to go to Dominican, I did start I did those two positions and then I also did some traveling and I was visiting a friend of mine who lives in Colorado who I ended up living with when my plans in the Dominican were canceled and I had already moved out of my apartment in Atlanta and didn't know where to go. And she had mentioned that she had a friend, she knew a friend of a friend who had taught in the bush. And this was a couple of months before and I thought, oh yeah, maybe I'll do that one day. That sounds, that sounds fun. And that day came sooner than I expected it to. And so then I ended up reaching out to this friend of a friend who had worked for the district that I saw the posting for and had a little, got a little bit of her perspective. And was it something that enticed you? Did you, were there certain, did you have reservations or fears when you went in or were you just kind of like excited, you know, you know, hundred percent? Yeah. Um, that's a tough question because I done a lot of, I, different things and I've lived a lot of different places. And I guess I'm always a little hesitant and I always feel a little nervous about it because everywhere you go is going to be different, but I always do the excitement always outweighs those reservations and I always do it anyway. So it's hard to answer that, but I think I had some reservations because I'd never lived anywhere so remote and it's concerning to think, you know, what happens if I have to go to the doctor and we're a two hour flight from the hospital and, and those types of things do come up. But then I thought about, you know, when's the last time I actually had to go to the hospital and it's been years. So statistically, I probably won't need to go. Uh, so those kind of things do come up, but it's really, once I got here, I was completely so comfortable here and I was just so excited to come and that outweighed all my reservations. Yeah. And you you refer used the term the bush before. Is that just kind of what is that? What is that? Is there a meaning? I could kind of infer what that means, but is there in Alaska? Does that mean a particular thing? Yeah. So the bush is pretty much any part of Alaska not on the road system. The road con- system connects Seward and Homer, which are about a two to three hour drive south of Anchorage, all the way north to Fairbanks, and then. You can drive past that to Dead Horse, but I think only milit- uh, people who work on the slope and the oil fields might be allowed past that point. And then it goes over to Valdez. So it's just like a big triangle almost that goes through the middle of Alaska. And everything outside of that is technically considered the bush, although not the cities. So Juneau, for example, is not on the road system, but not the bush. Mm-hmm. But it's all the villages that aren't reached. Reach, reachable by road. It's the remote areas, most of Western Alaska. So anywhere West of Anchorage, which is about half the state is all the bush. And then pretty much anything North of Fairbanks, which is also about half the state. And then also all the areas around Juneau is also all considered the bush. So it's a strong majority of the state in terms of size. I, we when when we were in Alaska, I, I remember my mind being blown by this idea. I think like Anchorage doesn't have a road out of town. Like it doesn't. It's not connected to the system, right? Uh, the, Anchorage not, is, but it's not much. There's like essentially okay. there's one road north and one road south. Okay. And one but east. just that idea of like not being able to get on the road and go anywhere, <laughs> it just seems so. Um, confounding so how do you how do you get there like say i don't know you're in philadelphia and you want you're you're going to your your town like how how many legs to that trip are they and what are the legs 
So you can fly, you fly to you know, Anchorage just as normal. So that can be, you know, one or two okay. legs depending. And then uh-huh. from Anchorage, I am lucky this year, actually. So I settled, I went to a different village first and the school district wasn't a great fit. And then I moved to this one and that one was also in the bush. And that one I had to then fly from Anchorage to Bethel, which is a city in the West that you can't drive to. It's technically considered part of the bush. I think it's a city of, I don't know, a few ten thousand, tens of thousand people. I don't know. But, and then I had to fly from there. And now I'm in a village where I can fly directly from Anchorage, which direct is a relative term in the bush. Usually you make four to five stops, but you're it's one plane from Anchorage. And that actually has enormous benefits. I know, I think the New York Times did an article this week about how people in the bush can order DoorDash and Uber Eats and Grubhub from (laughs) Anchorage. And that is a thing that people can do now because some of these, if you fly directly from a city like that, where I was living before, nothing like that was an option because we had, it had to go on, it would have had to go on another plane from Anchorage to Bethel and then somebody would have to get it from that big, from Alaska Airlines and Bethel to the little air, the Bush Airlines that fly out to the villages. So none of that was possible. So in that way, my life has become a little bit easier and more posh than it was in my first village. But mm-hmm. yeah, there's there's a lot of things like that. But overall, it's one flight to Anchorage, one from Anchorage. And the number of stops, stops between Anchorage and Perryville could be anywhere between zero and seven. So is it, are these like propeller? How, how big are the planes that you're taking? That you're also varies. Around? So um, uh-huh. in my last village, it was always the mail plane, which is usually like a six seater. And usually it's just you and the pilot. We get those down here sometimes. Six. You, you didn't say 60 or 16. You said six seater. Yeah. <laughs> a, Cessna, a Cessna 207, I think uh-huh. is, it was uh-huh. the most common. If anybody knows their airplanes. And then mm-hmm. that's something you learn living out here very quickly is <laughs> types of airplanes. And here we get, we have more of a variety here. So we sometimes have the Cessnas or the Pipers, the six six to eight seaters. But more often, I think it's the 10 to 12 seaters because the start of the Aleutians right south of us is there's a town or a village called King Cove where there's a really large seafood canning place called Peter Pan Seafood, I believe. And so they often have people going down there. So we usually will get bigger planes, but it really depends. And our mail plane is always one of the six, six to eight seaters, I think. And how, like how um, scarce are supplies? I mean, do, do you have to kind of know the, the you know, the, the flight schedule of the plane bringing food in or like, do you, are you hunting? Like what, what's like, you know, what, what's the, how do you get food and stuff? Yeah. So most people here uh, live a subsistence lifestyle. So they do hunt uh, most of their food or gather berries and all of that. And there's a lot of fishing. I'm actually a vegetarian. So I had to be a little more creative, but I do also do berry picking and make a lot of food out of that and other subsistence that I could participate in. And otherwise you, there are, we do actually have two stores in our town two small ones and they have some of the essentials, eggs and flour and sugar. And then some things get flown in and you have to sort of figure out the plane schedule. I seem to have bad luck when I've tried, we can get Instacart in our my current village with the planes. And for whatever reason, whenever I order, even if there's planes coming, there's never room and it takes two weeks. And my colleagues always seem to get theirs the next day. So I have bad luck with it or <laughs> I'm doing something wrong or I upset somebody at the airline. I don't know, but (laughs) they've had a lot of good luck and it just depends. But I usually order when I'm ordering things, I'm not ordering, you know, cucumbers. I'm ordering squash, things that will last longer and that will be okay if they're rough housed a little bit. Wow. Um, And so, and you, you don't eat the fish then either. You're. I don't, I wish I did. Honestly, but I became a vegetarian when I was like 12 and it's been hard going back, okay. but I wish culturally, culturally, I wish I did eat some, at least some of that, but it's been mm. so long. 
And and what's I guess the people that are they um I guess and Native Alaskans are they mm-hmm. a mix of I don't know people okay it's all yeah so in my village everybody identifies as a Alaska Native I believe besides the teachers so it's mm-hmm. a very it's a Lutic which is mm-hmm. a type of sub, a subset of the Alaska Native peoples and it's a Lutic slash Supiak which are the people of Kodiak Island which you've probably heard of. And it's, yeah, a little bit like a, a smaller, one of the smaller subsets, I believe. Okay. And are, are they, I mean, forgive me, but I guess this is just, I, I don't even have like, I guess the words language. Like, so are they, are they, is there, are their lives just kind of like subsisting? Are there, are they employed doing things? Like what's, what is, what, I guess, what, what are they doing in that town? Why, what are they doing? And like, I guess what keeps them there? Yeah. So there's a, Alaska Alutic people have a really have really strong cultural traditions so that is a lot of what I think keeps people here and it's it's incredibly beautiful I've had people come in who have been to I don't know 30 to 60 villages in Alaska and they all say it's the most beautiful one that they've ever been to Um, but they have a lot of there's a lot of different options so there are a lot of jobs in town because you have everything you need to run a town. You have a village office, you have a gov- local government. The, their government here is tribal. So they have tribal council members, they have a tribal president, they have a village coordinator. The Alaska s- sort of, I'm still understanding this myself, but it's kind of the way the Alaska government doesn't we don't really have reservations i think there's one reservation in alaska but the way they incorporate tribal entities is through tribal corporations so there's the local tribal government and then there's a tribal corporation that oversees it so that's a lot of different positions there's a little gas station even though we're not on the road system we have roads in the village and we have boats and so every most people have either a four-wheeler a vehicle and or a boat so we have a gas station a little gas station a few people run stores and we had some people running like little a little coffee shop where they would they had an espresso machine and they would d- deliver coffees, but they haven't been doing that. Things like that. We have people who work for the internet. There's usually in each village, there's a person who works for GCI, which is the big Alaska internet company, and they are kind of the on the ground person. There's a number of people employed at the school. There, yeah, so many things. There's, um, I just thought of one more. Oh, there for the airlines, they have what you call an agent so that you know when the air plane is coming and they coordinate that. And each of the airlines has somebody doing that. So it's a, it's a strong variety. Some people do leave and go live elsewhere, just like, you know, out of any town. And others go away for, some will go away for college in Anchorage and then come back. So it's a, it's a really large spectrum. That's, I mean, that's a lot, especially for a village of 89. There's a, there's a wide variety of different things people are doing. Yeah. And it's um, most villages, I think, like most schools will sometimes have trouble finding people to work because there are so many different jobs and the villages are small. Mm-hmm. So sometimes schools will struggle to find people to work there from the village, but we've been lucky. And and so you're are you the are you the, the the teacher for the village? Do you have a certain age range? Like what's what's your position there now? What are you doing? So I'm the secondary teacher as well as the head teacher. So we our school has a principal, but not a principal in the school building. He lives in Anchorage and he's a principal for four different schools. And each of his schools has a head teacher who runs sort of the day to day operations. And he. Yeah, because of that, that's a lot of what I end up doing is sort of the on the ground, making sure everything's working, making sure lunch is planned that day. And then I'm the secondary teacher. So I have grades seven and up, eight, seven or eight and, and up in every subject. That's that's a, quite a range. And and do you, how much is how much did your education like prepare you for this? And how much of it is you really just kind of learning as you go how to be a teacher for such a vast age range and for such a vast array of subjects? Well, my original degree and certification is in elementary education, so uh-huh. um, that has its benefits and its drawbacks because I did learn 
strategies and concepts in every subject, and um, but of course at a much lower level. So that has been interesting. I sort of took a unique approach to my college education, and I did took a lot of things on, and I also did an extra certification in in English uh, as a second language, and that goes from K to 12, kindergarten through 12th grade. So I did end up, and I also did internships in, in high schools and different subjects and different grades and different organizations. So I, I tested out a lot of different things and I, I felt more prepared than most. I don't think that's the case for a lot of people. Uh, Alaska has really high rates of turnover, especially in the villages, because it is, it is a lot and it can be challenging. But my school district, and it's part of why I ended up moving from my other village to this one and picking the school district, they really have a strong emphasis on small class sizes. So most classes only have between five and 10 students, which is incredible. And they also are very supportive and have a lot of organizations and, and relationships that are available to, to support to support teachers. So I think that helps. And our turnover rate is a little bit lower than a lot of the districts in Alaska, but yeah, overall it's really high across the state and it's, it's can be tough, especially if you're not prepared. Unfortunately, a really strong issue here is that a lot of teachers go out to the villages with the intention of only staying a year, which is really not great for the communities and not great for the students and for the development of, of the regions. And I actually had somebody here, they're working on our airfield right now and, and are putting in satellites so that planes can hopefully get here a little, a little bit easier. And I was talking to one of the women r- running that project and she said, she said, oh, well, you haven't left yet. It's winter, it's summer break. And I said, no, you know, I wanted to get out a little bit, go out on the boat and I don't eat meat, but I'll go on fishing and hunting trips with the locals and, and everything. And and she said, oh, well, are you coming back here next year? And I said, yeah. And she said, most people I've met, most teachers in the villages only stay for a year, and and which is really unfortunate. But that's something that our district has been working to not have that as, as often. But yeah, it can be really common that people only stay for a year because it's tough. And it, it is, but at the same time, there's a lot of freedom and flexibility in how you teach. And that's what I really like about being out here. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> so your class has five to ten children and it, you're are you going are you giving one lecture to everybody or are you kind of more individualized talking to each person for a bit about each like subject like how do, how does that work as a as a teacher I try to do everything whole group as much as I can because there's so much value in students working together and learning from each other it is tough to make that work especially this is my first year in this position and I didn't really know everything I was teaching I was learning, learning as I was going. So it was tougher. And I think that'll be easier next year, but we have a standards based system. I don't know if you're familiar with that, but for any listeners that aren't, it is not based on grades and grade level, but based on what, you know, so we follow standards. We have, let's say, I don't know, 20 standards for ninth grade history. And then they can go, they have, it's, they don't go to onto 10th grade history when they finish you know, at the end of the year, they go on when they finish those standards. So it could take six months or it could take a year and a half or it could take anywhere in between. And that allows us to have a a system where you can rotate in certain subjects. So in science and social studies, you can rotate what you're teaching and it doesn't have to be, okay, you're in ninth grade, you're taking this one, you're in 10th grade, you're taking this one. It's we're all taking ninth grade history this year. And then we're all taking 10th grade history next year. And you just need a certain number of credits of courses finished to graduate, if that makes sense. Mm-hmm. So that makes it a lot easier. And we've been implementing that. The standards-based system has been in place here for over 20 years, which is pretty incredible because a lot of schools are trying to move in that direction. And it's really a great system, especially in villages like this, where the, there's so many different things that the students are doing with their subsistence living and everything else that they have more flexibility in their school schedule. And they can, there's only 10 grades worth of requirements. So technically you could graduate in 10th grade if that was appropriate for you. 
and, but you can also keep going until you're 21, depending on what your personal needs are. So it's really individual, individualized for what students need. Okay. And does, again, the part of this might be a very basic question, but does everybody speak English and do you have to be yourself be learning a new language to be, I guess, you know, fully integrated into the village? It, yeah, it depends on where you are. Unfortunately, Alutic is one of the languages that's currently sort of dying and it's something that we're working on bringing back. So in our village, there isn't as much proficiency in, in their native language. And that's partially because our village is a new village that started at, in, I think, 1912. There was an, in a volcanic eruption in Katmai. Um, if you've heard of Katmai National Park, it's, a, it's about an hour north of here by Bush Plain. And that's actually where all of our village came from. They all lived there. And after the eruption, came down here. And so in that transition, some cultural traditions and history was lost. And we're trying to get that all back right now. And we're trying to work with the community. And that's a big part of living in a, in a village like this is that I'm learning more, uh, more than I'm teaching. Because I am from the outside and, and it's not my cultural heritage, but I want to help them continue to foster that. So we've been working a lot with the village, with local organizations and receiving grants to bring more cultural instruction into the schools and to try to really booster that, that bolster that, that language education and other villages. It's more in other regions there is a lot more native proficiency in Yupik, for example, central Yupik is in a lot of Western Alaska and they have relatively high proficiencies considering, but as you probably know with colonization and everything that's happened in the last couple hundred years unfortunately a lot of that was lost and, and we have to do what we can to try to support them and bolstering that again were there any um i guess what, what kind of cultural adjustments did you have to go through and once you settled there that's a great question it's a lot of i, I took um my uh, you have to take certain alaska studies classes to be able to be certified in the state and i took one in the form of a culture camp before I came. So I received a lot of that knowledge directly, but, and it was kind of natural for me when I came in and also because I've lived in other places, but a lot of Alaska native life is based on like um, nature and the subsistence and being outside and experiencing all of that. And that was stuff that I was really interested in and had a lot of experience with. But a lot of it is understanding the weather patterns and maybe going out when it's not the ideal conditions, which is not something I was used to. And go, I went on a few hunting and fishing trips when it was really weather where I would have preferred to stay home, but I really wanted to have the experience. And so that type of thing was an adjustment. The bush planes were a huge adjustment for me. I have always been a little bit of a nervous flyer, so that was a little bit tough at first and it's something that I've been working to try to get get better about because it's still it's still a challenge but I'm hoping to get my I, working on my private pilot's license private pilot private pilot's license so that I can feel more comfortable with that the um, subsistence way of life was new for me and it's really tough sometimes I I really enjoy berry picking and 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 using that to make food, but it does take, I mean, it takes hours to get one bucket of berries and it's taught me a lot wow. about endurance and working hard and persisting. And the first time I went out and I got a small bull's worth and I was like, okay, that's enough for now. And it took, that took me a little while to get used to. So what, what other, like what other foods, if you were living off of the land, like what, I guess the, the locals, like what, what, if they're living off the land, what is their, what is their diet? So there are a lot of different types of berries. There are tundra grasses that you can do different, use for different purposes. Caribou is very common. A lot of salmon fish and halibut. I, there are other animals that, that are caught, not all are used for food, but they, they catch or trap wolves, bears, 
foxes, um, birds are used for food. Ptarmigan is a really common one, which I hadn't heard of before I moved here. Uh, those are the main ones that I can think of. But there's also roots that can be hmm. used for different purposes. And yeah, a lot of – I'm learning new ones every day. I've only been here for two years in this village for one, so I'm learning new things every day. But that's a lot of it. And, and I mean, can you even – like? I, mean, I imagine that a good portion of the year you can't pick anything, or is there always is that always possible? You, like you can't dig roots out of the tundra in the winter, I imagine, can you? No. So most of it's done in, in the spring and fall and summer and then frozen throughout the year. So the goal is to get as much as you can when it's there and then freeze it for the for the duration of the year. And people who here who have been doing it for years and years, it's natural and they know how much to get. And we're so you still try to figure it out when you when you move in you kind of have to figure out the right mm -hmm. amount but it takes it takes a while so that's why a lot of people will spend weeks and weeks and weeks berry picking in in august and then freeze it all up or or they do a lot of pickling or jarring and that type of thing as well so if you're so i mean when you first got there did you were they were you told hey taryn so if you want to survive the winter you need like 50 pounds of blueberries or like what what how does that how does that work how and how are you learning and like what what do you need to get by for the winter um yeah you we i had a roommate my first year and we kind of just went out and got as much as we could and and local stores you know get as much as you can and and they demonstrated what what they had but yeah you kind of just figure it out as you're going and that's the case with everything it's figuring out which which companies will ship out here it's figuring out you know the schedules and all of that and and a barge comes in once a year so that's a, a way a lot of people get rice and flour and, and larger larger portions of, of certain things and so it's that's something it's all learning as you go, I think, for a lot of that. And the way you're talking about the berry picking, it doesn't sound like it, there's not like a, if people don't own, own the land, is it just like, they just go out in the wild and you're picking things or do people have claim to certain plots? They're areas? tender berries, so they do grow just sort of everywhere, but it is respectful to make sure, you know, I always ask first just which ones people were, or which ones were available because there are ones closer to people's houses or ones that people use more often. And uh, as a visitor from outside, I always am careful to make sure that I'm being respectful and not just going where I'm not invited. So I have always just asked for recommendations and, and the more you live there, the more you find too. And honestly though, there's still, it's become tough with climate change. A lot of sources have dwindled but for the most part there's still enough growing that it's not really a concern there's enough for everybody but it has gone down over the years so what was your you had mentioned the, the i guess going out on the boat or going on a hunt what like where what, what are those like what when, how is it how does that unfold how how harsh is the conditions what are they doing yeah, so I've gone out on a few trips for fishing and hunting, and it's, it's – I'm a very outdoorsy person, but I'm also a very go-outside kind of when I want to, when, it, when it's nice and kind of person. Not always, but I'm not used to spending longer time out, you know, 12 hours out when it's raining. So that was – I went out – we went on a fishing trip when it was raining a little bit, and that was – a new experience and it's a lot of you know it's more mentally than physically that you have to kind of be used to just kind of adjust to being on your own or out in the nature and the quiet for 12 hours at a time it's not something that most people are used to and it's not something I was used to before I, I mean I lived in cities mostly before I lived here so that was an adjustment and yeah, you go out until you get what you have. So you could go out for four hours or you could go out for 12, but you get you go out until you have enough. And yeah, I've gone out on trips like that where it's taken longer than I thought. And uh, a sort of tenant of living out here is agreeing, especially when you're new, it's 
agreeing to go out as often as possible. So one the first time I went, it was after school and I was tired and they invited me and I said, I, oh, I really want to go to bed, but I also <laughs> or get ready for bed. But I also know that this is my chance to show them that I, I want to be involved in their culture and I want want to learn from them. So I'll have to, so I'll do it. And so that's a lot of it too, is just not knowing uh, is kind of something you have to get used to that they might show up, you know, when you're still in bed on Sunday morning and say, you want to come. And, and I know I have to say yes, if I, if I want to be able to keep being invited because I need to show them that my, I'm engaged. So that's been a lot of the adjustment I think. And it's sort of, yeah, uh, watching the weather. Oh, it's nice today. We're going to go right now and being ready mm-hmm. to go at any, at any moment's notice. I mean, you're 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 part of the community. I mean, you obviously have an important function there, but there that goes beyond that to be like, you know, we're going to go get food. You're a part of the community. You're kind of looked upon. Like, if you didn't go, would you get cut out of getting that food, or you just would like you be isolated from the community? Some people, a lot of teachers don't go. A lot of teachers in villages mm-hmm. in the bush will say no or won't reach out, and that's why so so few people make it or stay a long time in the villages. And that was a case in one of the villages in the previous village I lived in that the person who I was replacing said that she wasn't really involved in the community and nobody, she didn't really have any friends in the community. But when I've talked to her more, I realized that she had just never kind of put herself out there. And it's, it's not easy for everybody, especially if you're coming from a place where you're not used to having to kind of humble yourself like that. But a lot of it is sort of admitting that you don't know everything and that you're newer to the culture. And when you get educated people who have, you know, I think they have the answers going into villages and they're, they're not always um, able to do that so easily. So that's kind of a tangent, but yeah. long story short is it makes it tough. And I really love hang, be, I want to be part of the community. That's why I live here. So I really love being invited places and going places. And that's something that I, have that's important to me so I always want to say yes when I'm able to and or if I can and then the more I'm involved the more they see that I'm interested and engaged in their culture and that I want to be involved and that pays you know you get out what you put in I mean it's interesting because it's almost like you know you can say you want to be part of the village but what they're looking for is actions especially because I imagine with so, so many so few people like you really either contribute you make a difference if you decide to go on that that boat trip or that hunting trip like yeah if you and, opt and out be, it, it, yeah on. and to be quite frank a lot of historically white people have come to these villages and done a lot of not great things and been there to give their culture instead of the other way around. And it's really important to me to make sure that I'm doing what I can for the community. And I'm technically in charge of what happens in the school on a day-to-day basis, but I want to make sure that the community is informed and giving input and providing their insight into what we're doing every day. And, And I want to make sure they know that I want to learn their way of doing things. And I want to try to integrate myself as much as I can. And I don't want to be the kind of person that comes in and says, no, I'm here to teach. And that's all I'm going to do. I'm going to teach you how to do things my way. And that I'm going to go home and watch my movies and go to bed. And I don't, and that happens a lot still, but yeah, it's such a, because of the historical events that have taken place, it's so important to, to do that, to take in there, to show people that I'm here to learn that I'm here to be involved that I want to be part of their culture and do what I can. So Mm -hmm. that's part of why I came here and that's what I'm working on. And I guess there's a two part question in terms of thinking about like, you know, how remote you are and I guess how isolating it would feel. I mean, again, compared to like, you know, where I live in like Brooklyn. Um, So I guess the, the two questions about that is like, for you, do you ever feel like, I mean, honestly, like, like just the kind of like, just the sense of like isolation or remoteness that might be a little disorienting for somebody who's used to living in the city. And then the other part of the question is like, for the people, for the, the, the locals, do they have, I mean, this, I guess this is the life they live. So maybe they don't have any feeling like, oh, there's a different way of living or whatever. Like what, what is, I mean, it's a, I'm kind of mumbling my way through this, but just to kind of go that idea of like isolation or remoteness. So how does the, how do you feel about that? And how do the, 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 the local people feel about that? 
Well, culturally, that's a part of what people are used to. So I think a lot of people like the remoteness. A lot of people like that they can go at their own pace and take out their four wheeler for um, and drive along the beach for a couple hours and and you know. But like it, like anywhere, there's people. There are people that say, "When I turn 18, I'm leaving," and that's the case. And and especially with our system where you could graduate a little bit earlier, so to speak, there there's always people that want to do that. I think it's, it's, it's definitely an adjustment. I mean, it took, it took me a while to get used to the quietness, the remoteness. I, I don't struggle as much with the dark in the winter. I know a lot of people do. I think part of the reason I don't is because I have really good, really strong routines that I follow year day in and day out, no matter what. And I'm so busy between school and other things that I do that in some ways I'm busy, like with my scheduled days that I don't necessarily realize. And then on the weekends, I sort of happy to just be and go outside when I can, but when, you know, and enjoy what's around. So I've, I haven't struggled with that as much. And I know a lot of people do, but I think in terms of the, just being around my life is sort of as full, I think, as most people's in the, in the city, I might not be going to restaurants every night, but I'm cooking, which is equally as time consuming. If you're cooking, you know, I cook every night and I cook for a while. I, it's really important to me. I really like to eat. So I have to cook good food to have good food. So, and between reading and yoga and all the things, most of what I do is the same as when I lived in Philly or Atlanta for the most part. Um, it's just in a different location. And that's something that Maybe not everybody feels that way, but because of so much of my life is, you know, some stuff that I've worked on for years and I've developed and I know what makes me happy that it's easier to, to do all of that. I think, I do think it could be isolating, as I mentioned before, if you're not involved in the community and if you're not saying yes when they invite you out, I do think that would make it a lot tougher. I go to all the community meetings. I go to all the community events. I reach out to people and ask when they're doing things, if they could, if I can go with them. And that took a while because that took a while for me to get used to because I didn't want to feel like I was inviting myself places, but that was in my village, what was people expected. So, so that took me some adjustment to get used to, but, and then I have a few colleagues. I have, we have two other certified teachers at our school, as well as a preschool teacher and other people that work in the school. So that is also an easy way to get to know people and to get involved. And we have a lot of events at the school. We host a big Thanksgiving dinner and a Christmas event too. And so we do as much as we can to get the community involved and meeting us as well. And often that will, people will come to the events and then they'll invite us over to their event that they're having at their house for that holiday. And so that works out as well too. What, what, uh, what's Thanksgiving dinner up there? Is it, turkey or totally different it's uh more eclectic so we oh. ordered this year it was my first time doing it as the head teacher my first time as a head teacher and i didn't quite know how much to get of everything but we ordered like turkeys and potatoes and my students cooked all that stuff for the school and then or for the community and then the community members brought in a lot of different local dishes some more traditional for thanksgiving and some more traditional in their culture a really common one is a guduk, which I know a lot of people from outside the villages refer to as quote unquote Eskimo ice cream, which is berries and sugar and Crisco and sometimes fish is in it, but not always. And that's a very, very common dish that's pretty much always present at any gathering and in a lot of different, they make that, sometimes you make that with tender grass, I, I believe, and you can make it with any different types, all different types of berries. So that's a really common one. Wow. And then you had mentioned before, I guess, that, that about the, the, the darkness. Um, so I guess the darkest day of the year, like how much sunlight are you getting? And then like in the longest day of the year, how much sunlight are you getting? Where I live now, it's not quite as extreme since we're pretty far south. Although that's coming from somebody who's lived in Alaska for a couple of years. Maybe it is compared to New York. But (laughs) right now, I mean, it's only May. And right now it gets dark 
well after I go to bed, <laughs> but I go to bed early for most people. I, I'm after a full day, I'm usually in bed by 8.30, but I would say right now the sun rises maybe between, maybe around 6 a.m. and sets maybe around 10 to 11 and it's only May, so it's, it's going to be more. I lived in Fairbanks my first summer in Alaska, and that is, they call that the midnight sun city for a reason. You really do have it pretty much all night long. And then in the winter, I think the opposite. My last village was a little bit further north than here, probably halfway between here and Fairbanks in terms of uh, longitude, north to south. And they would get, we would, I'd say in the winter, we'd have maybe three hours of sunlight. And then the spring we had probably, yeah, 15 hours of daylight. It's hard to say because I'm sleeping for some yeah. of those hours. So <laughs> yeah. I don't know exactly. <laughs> no, 15 it, seems it, low it, now that I think about it. 18, yeah. 20 hours. It, and and I guess like I mean locals are are adapted to this because they I mean historically and traditionally and you know they're more adapted like for like I guess like I mean I don't know what the terminology be but non natives I guess like white people or anybody that's not a native non natives um how I guess how is that adjustment and does it change who you are like do you feel like living there you're a different person than you would be living in philadelphia because i as for me like as i've been trying to <clears throat> understand our country and thinking about how vast it is i've kind of settled on this i like, kind of like thinking about people like their grapes because I, I had sold wine for this for like 12 years and like one of the concepts in wine is terroir and the idea that a grape is really a product of its setting so when i think about trying to understand the different parts of like the lower 48 where you have less of like the like a native or traditional issue traditional i guess background like you have up there you know people are going to be uh, they're a product of their setting so in new york you look at the way somebody lives in montana and the way they think and see it's they're a product of their setting just like we are in new york um and i guess i'm just wondering like being up there do you feel yourself like it, i don't know becoming different but do you feel you, you know taking you've taken on a different outlook or you know how has that affected you yeah, with in terms of like yeah, the darkness and all of that, like I said, I didn't struggle with that particularly and that's partially mm -hmm. because I when I first moved to Germany, I did live in a village. It wasn't quite as small and it was uh, on the train, so it was a lot easier to get other places, but it was still an adjustment mm -hmm. at first from having lived 5 mm -hmm. years in Philadelphia with people around me all the time that I knew. And it took a few months for me to really adjust. And since then I've really cultivated sort of, and not to sound too super granola or E or anything, but like an inner happiness and like satisfaction that has made it really easy for me to adapt anywhere. And I think that's why I've had an easier time here than, than a lot of people do. But I do think the way it's affected my outlook the most is like I said before, is sort of humbling and reminding, like, I don't have the answers. I don't have the majority of the answer is I'm here to learn more than to teach. And sometimes I've made, you know, mistakes culturally, then I've had to adjust and, and apologize and figure out what I was, what I did wrong and what to do next. And so that has probably been the largest outlook change for me. And that's been something that I'm still working on every day and still trying to do the best I can to be the best person I can given the situation. And that's probably been the most I've had to adjust. But I know for a lot of people, like the natural world is the hard part and the adjusting. And I know it would be tough. I think if I'd come at 22 and like most, a lot of teachers do that come out here right out of college in Philadelphia or school in Philadelphia, I think that would have been tough because I wasn't the same person then that I am now. And I think that that probably would have required more of an adjustment. And I think, that's probably leads to a lot of the retention, but I think coming after I had lived in seven, eight different places and sort of cultivated this, this inner contentment with what I was doing, I think that made a huge difference. There, there's a feeling I, I see it with my daughter a little bit, and I, I'm sure that I was very much this way coming out of college, but I feel like you get kind of 
infused with this idea that you're going to change the world or that you can do any like whatever. And like one of the things that at least I've been, I mean, it took me a long time to think about it, but it's also that realization that sometimes you've got to learn a lot about that world and be deferential to it as well. Like that idea of humility that you're talking about is something where I don't know that that's what the issue would be if people are going up to Alaska to teach after, you know, they graduate from college. But I, I feel like there is, like you're saying, there's a sense of like, just you're here to learn, you're not here to impose anything or people you're here just to absorb. Yeah. And it is, and I have encountered people who have a, seem to have a type of white savior complex. I'm here. I have the answers and I'm going to give you those answers. And it's tough. And that is, has, and that's happened a lot historically since colonization. And because of that, there are some tensions from from the locals and people who come in from outside sometimes, and that's something that we have to work to overcome. And yeah, and that's, I read an article like two years ago before I came randomly, before I knew I was coming here from, it was actually a Penn professor, a U Penn professor, and he was writing about, I think in the New York Times, about his experience in the Peace Corps. And I believe he was from, I believe he was living in Nepal, and he was talking about how a, a white person, I think from Germany, would come in, a missionary, and would charge the locals $5 to get his pamphlet about his missionary work. And they would, because he was another white person, they would say, your friend is here, your friend is here. And then he would go over, this professor, and see this person and say, that's not my friend, and he, what he's doing is wrong. And and it, he would get really worked up about it. And then the moral of his his article towards the end was was we were both wrong because we both thought we had the answers when the answers should come from the locals. Maybe they wanted him there and maybe they didn't want me there. And that's something that I think about every day is, is I may think I'm doing the best thing if I'm doing something that's I think is culturally responsive and everything else, but I have to listen to what everybody else here says and what they want. And, and of course, there's a balance. I do have certain reasons that I'm here and certain things that I'm doing for the students. And it's a balance in sort of trying to demonstrate that we're doing some things a certain way because of this, but also I want to take in what you have to say about it. And I want to hear your perspective and I want to find a way that works for, for all of us. The, the, um, <clears throat> for me, the, the, I guess what, one of the things I've settled on and I, and if this doesn't, uh, I, I haven't been in your setting, but just even thinking about like the U S is it sounds like what you're the way you're living up there is almost, I think it seems like it would be even helpful here, like in the lower 48 where maybe you don't have necessarily the vast cultural differences because of the different heritages and everything. But I always, I, to me, I refer to like three things of like being like curious, being respectful and being compassionate. Um, and I feel like with those three traits, you really should be able to get along with almost with almost anyone, um, and and I think that obviously the there, I guess the situation you are in, it's probably more extreme differences in, in culture and history, and you're you know treading carefully and respectfully. It sounds like you're doing all that, but it would seem that that almost would apply here too, like because there, there's a lot of there's vast cultural differences in different parts of the U.S. I mean, you don't even have to go that far from you know Philadelphia mm -hmm. or you know New York City to find people who have a very different outlook on life and have a very different traditions. I mean, it might not be as obvious as traditions for like native Alaskans, but there, there are, I guess everybody has their own traditions and their own kind of cultural norms. Yeah. Yeah. I think adding to those three skills, I think being observant is probably what served me one more than almost anything else, because it's a lot of learning, watching, seeing what everyone else is doing and trying to, find a way to fit into that while also bringing in your own, your own take. And that was something, yeah, we encountered, I encountered a lot in college with people from all over. And that was the first time I I'd been around so many different people. I'm from Cape Cod, Massachusetts, which is pretty uh, gentrified, pretty, it's, yeah. it's homogenous. Yeah, I did not interact with a lot of <laughs> different types of people <laughs> growing up very, for the most part. Yeah. So it, it, college kind of threw me into that. And then I don't, that kind of sparked my love to be involved in different cultures and my interest in experiencing different places and different people. So it was a, it's been a long journey of trying to figure out who I am in this general 
broader worlds and trying to make see you know blend in with as many and get along with as many people as possible so and where does this fit into your like like bigger like life like do you find your as you picture your personal trajectory your professional trajectory does this has this changed like what your outlook is or is it kind of another like kind of building block towards something either you you can envision or you can't and you're just kind of taking it like you know year to year I'd say both I think growing up I grew up in sort of a non-traditional setting and, and I kind of at first had planned everything out in my life because I wanted stability. That was what I didn't have growing up and that's what I wanted. So I said, I'm going to get a job. I'm going to become a teacher. I didn't want to become a teacher because of the stability of that particular job. I do really love it, but it kind of of worked out to be (laughs) one of the more stable jobs, but not the way I've done it. Um, Mm. And so I, that was sort of my plan at first. And then as soon as I graduated from college, I realized things don't go quite as planned and my plans changed a lot. And now I'm sort of just along for the ride. I, part of me really loves living abroad and could see myself doing that forever. And that was on the trajectory I was on before I came here. But at the same time, I really love living here. And I really believe that there's so many things in our educational system that need to be fixed. And I need to be here to be in the country to, to fix those. So, and I know I would be happy with either of those outcomes in my life and I'd be happy with another outcome. So I'm kind of just along for the ride now seeing where life takes me and where things go. And I plan to be here for, for at least a few years because the students in the community and the district need that stability. And, and I job hop, I job hopped through my twenties. So it's probably good for me to have some stability too. (laughs) And yeah, kind of just seeing where the wind takes me. Well, you know, it's interesting because like one of the I noticed I was looking through the the New York City Department of Education website for curriculums leading to like civic engagement. And you touched upon something which I noticed was lacking and like, you know, New York City is probably the biggest like education department. And I may very well have missed something. I don't know. But in looking to it. And I, and I think we're all trained. I think in college, you, at least at Penn, like I, I felt like you're trained like to use your voice, right? Like you learn how to write and articulate and advocate and be outspoken. And the New York City curriculum has a lot of things about how to use your voice, how to do this, how to do that. But what they don't have have is anything about how to listen. Mm-hmm. How to, how to cause I think, because in some respect, listening is also communication. It's, it's, it's like, as you were saying before, with like joining the people, uh, joining like your neighbors when they go out on a hunt or on a fishing is like, you communicate with your actions as well. You communicate by, by saying, I will listen and not talk. I will communicate by participating in what you're doing. And I think it was just interesting to see, like, you know, there's lots of lessons about how to talk, but there's no lessons about how to listen. And I, I think that's kind of one thing that you don't really see much of is that is that, and you're you're immersed. Yeah, in I think it's an underrated a PhD. skill, and especially yeah, honestly, in the United States, I think that's something that people are so used to. Yeah, standing up and give your voice and all of hearing all of that that it becomes sort of a lost art here, and I think that's something again that people need to foster in order to be successful in these cross cultural environments and. It's, yeah. And, it's and in many respects, it's almost like, and, and in many respects, like in the U S it's there, there, I think we're all being immersed in cross-cultural adjustments in that, like you're in New York, but you're, you're being exposed to ways of thinking and looking at the world from you know, any other state or like, you know, even in the rural parts of your own state. Um, again, not maybe as big of a gap or a difference as what you're experiencing, but still that same idea. Mm-hmm at least in, in my eyes. So well, one last thing I remember noticing, if I, if I remember correctly, there was, was there like a, like a pretty powerful earthquake near where you are? Wasn't yes. there like recently? Yes, there was hmm. July 29th, 2021. It was the most par- powerful earthquake of the year in the world, uh, an 8.2 wow. that was right off the coast of our village. I was not here yet, but yeah. And what did the town's people say? Was there was there a tsunami? Did they feel the earthquake? Did they was there a lot of damage to the village? You definitely felt that one. It was a big one. You mm-hmm. feel we feel we have we're on the ring of fire, so we feel mm-hmm. a lot of earthquakes and 
they, I think anything that's like within, anything that's like magnitude three or higher, you feel anything that's within 30 miles lower, you feel. And they are used, people here are used to it. That was one of the first questions somebody asked me as they said, how do you do with earthquakes? I said, we're about to find out. <laughs> I've never, I've never experienced them before. That time we had, they had, they were on tsunami warning for, I think over three hours. They were at the tsunami shelter and we've only had tsunami, a tsunami warning once since I've been here. And it was a magnitude 6.1. And that was the, the largest I've experienced so far. I was actually checking yesterday because, you know, there's a triangle you can find online of how common each magnitude of earthquake is and there's approximately one per year eight or higher and there has not been one yet this year actually so that's something that i was looking at because i have a, a lot i really am interested in seismology and i've been doing a lot with my students so i was looking at that and i was like i wonder where it'll be this year and um yeah but yeah so that's a really common situation here and you have earthquakes pretty much every day you don't always feel them but very common. We we did a project with my students, and I think we calculated twenty something earthquakes between January, uh, September, and April, and those are just the ones we could feel. Wow, <laughs> there's, a, there's a lot going on there. Nature is definitely like <laughs> making its presence known in many different ways. Yes, and we've had we've had a lot <laughs> of great experiences because of that. Though we've had the Alaska Volcano Observatory, which is which is a consortium of three different organizations, came down and worked with our students. We also have a volcano. I guess I should have oh. said that right behind our village. Yeah. A lot of wow. the the Active volcano, volcano observatory. Hmm? Active volcano. Yes, and the observatory said one person from there said when the people moved here from Katmai after that eruption, they went from the frying pan into the fire because it's a larger earthquake and a more active one, I believe. So <laughs> it's pretty fascinating. Wow. Wow. And the last thing, just for understanding the weather and the setting, like how, how cold does it get during the winter? Or in how, Again, how hot because we're so far south, it's not as bad. Last year was a lot more snow and below zero weather here it doesn't go below zero very often because we're coastal and we're south, southern so it doesn't go below zero very often i'd say it hovers around maybe 10 degrees for a lot of the winter and then i don't know how warm it gets in the summer yet because i haven't been here I, this week it's been i think maybe about 60 a little lower and it's felt toasty <laughs> compared mm. to what we're used to so it's been t-shirt weather for for the last couple wow. of weeks it's been warmer there than here in new york yeah, you do get though. The, <laughs> the main thing here is wind. You get a lot of very extreme winds. That that's what's going on right now. We have a having having a storm today. So, oh wow! I guess, yeah, there's no shelter from the other than the mountains. There's there doesn't sound like there's any shelter from the wind or your houses. Yeah, so there's mountains on one side, and then the other side's coast. So it's just mm -hmm. there are some islands out there that are mountainous, but mostly. Mm -hmm. Wow. All right. Well, I'm sure you have much, uh, much else to do for your day. Um, but you know, before I finish up, I'd just love to ask you, like, you know, what what gives you hope at the end of the day? I think seeing the students, and this may be a cliche answer, but all they that they're doing and accomplishing, and there are students that I see that I interact with in my school and other schools in our region who are so much more qualified or ready for the world at hand than I felt like I was. And so I think seeing how far we've come in a lot of different ways is really, really does give me hope. And as far how far we've come in other ways as well with what we're working on worldwide and, and related to the climate and everything else, I think all of that knowledge and knowing that we're in a much better situation than we were in a lot of ways when I was growing up, that I think that gives me hope. Great. Cool. All right. Well, Taryn, thank you. Thanks so much for, for I guess, you know, all of our exchanges of emails and like patiently kind of waiting to see when we could schedule. This has been been fantastic. Thank you very much. Thank you for having me. I've enjoyed talking to you. Yeah. All right. Take care. Have a good day. You too. Thanks.